So hi, everyone. Happy New Year and welcome to the first installment of the Spring 2021 QSide Colloquium Series. We're so excited to have you all here today with us. My name is Haley Taylor and I work as a senior fellow for QSide. A few operational notes. At the end of this session, we're going to adjourn to a standard Zoom meeting for an informational slash cocktail slash coffee hour where we can chat more informally with each other. The access link will be shared in the chat closer to the end of the talk. We'd also like to encourage any of you who are joining us today who are not officially part of our affiliate program or a consortium program to consider joining. The affiliate program is completely free to join and the consortium is a paid membership program, but anyone wishing to join can apply for a scholarship if budgets are tight. I'll include links to those in the meeting chat as well. Today's colloquium is the first of six to come this spring and an installment in a lot of exciting programming that we have planned for QSide in 2021. Our colloquium series features six exciting speakers who will discuss issues related to theory, inclusion, diversity, and equity. Please visit our colloquium webpage and consider registering for and sharing information about all of the other talks we've planned this year with, our, with your colleagues who might be interested. We're also incredibly excited to announce the inaugural launch of our Data for Justice Conference on April 16th, 2021. It will take place completely virtually and feature talks from experts in our five research areas inclusion in the arts, criminal justice, healthcare equity, environmental justice, and education equity, with a keynote address from Heather McGee, former president of Demos and co-chair of Color of Change. Our first 200 registrants will receive a free copy of McGee's latest book. Registration is open and scholarships are available for those who need them. If you would like to support QSide in the production of more exciting research and activism initiatives, we graciously appreciate any and all donations made to our organization, since your support is what keeps us going. As we progress through our session today, please feel free to ask questions through the Q&A tool located at the bottom feature of the webinar. We'll have time at the end of the presentation for some questions and answers. And one last note, please be advised that today's session is being recorded and will be displayed publicly on QSide web and social media channels. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Aruna D'Souza. D'Souza writes about modern and contemporary art, intersectional feminisms, and other forms of politics, and how museums shape our views of each other and the world. Her most recent book, Whitewalling, Art, Race, and Protests in Three Acts, was named one of the best art books of 2018 by the New York Times. Her work regularly appears in fourcolumns.org, where she's a member of the Editorial Advisory Board, and has also been published in the Wall Street Journal, CNN.com, Art News, Garage, Book Forum, Art in America, among other places. She's currently editing two forthcoming volumes, Making It Modern, a Linda Nochlin reader, and Lorraine O'Grady's Writing in Space, 1973 to 2018, and is co-curator of the upcoming retrospective of O'Grady's work, Both And, which will open in March 2021 at the Brooklyn Museum. Thank you, Aruna. Thank you, Haley. Um, okay, I'm going to uh, switch over. Thank you so much to QSide, to Jude and Chad and Haley and Emily and all your colleagues for inviting me uh, to speak today. Um, you know, it's, uh, I've, I was telling Jude that I was a little nervous um, uh, talking in the realm of, um, you know, in the context of people who are interested in data and social science approaches to uh, equity in the arts, but I hope I'll give you a sort of um, bird's eye view of some of the issues that seem very pressing to me um, in relation to discussions about uh, equity and, and um, and the cultural sector. So I'm just going to share my screen. Here we go. Now, is that showing up for you? I hope, I hope so. Someone will tell me if it's not. Um, so I wanted to talk about uh, the sort of cultural landscape. Um, and by cultural landscape here, I mean a very much narrower view of the cultural landscape uh, than some might think. And that is the landscape of cultural institutions in the US uh, in the wake of the protests in the spring um, around uh, the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and countless other uh, Black uh, men and women and other people of color uh, by the police around the country. Uh, and 
you know, I think for many of, I think, you know, the protests that broke out in the spring uh, were uh, intense and much more widespread, um, more widespread, not just among black protesters, but actually among uh, white liberals uh, than had occurred in previous iterations of Black Lives Matters protests, including Ferguson uh, a few years before. But they were also um, more, uh, uh, I think, urgent for institutions who since, say, for the last five or seven years have been uh, making a lot of noises towards um, coming up with more racially equitable um, uh, programming and hiring plans. And so I think the uh, June 2020 uh, protests uh, I think for a lot of museums, there were, uh, there was an especial urgency to kind of speak out uh, once again about just what they were doing uh, to address questions of racial equity. And of course, for museums, uh, the uh, question is quite urgent since the Association of American Museums had have put out a very famous report a few years ago indicating that um, in terms of staffing museums, in fact, uh, for their uh, decision-making staff, in other words, not security, not front of house, um, you know, people at the admissions desk or working in the ca cafes, um, but people in sort of decision-making roles and programming roles, curatorial roles, uh, were, and you know, above 85% white, um, and the percentage of Black, Latino, even Asian um, staff was, you know, really deplorably minuscule. And so the museums have been, uh, over the past years, feeling increased pressure, um, both from younger staff members who get hired onto the museum and are much more vocal about uh, addressing questions of equity and inclusion uh, by the art market, interestingly enough, uh, in which many, in which, uh, which is right now seeing a lot of uh, Black artists um, becoming very uh, 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 sort of important players within the art market in the sense of their work is selling for more money. And so therefore, when museums want to do exhibitions of their work, they are being, uh, they are, are, are being looked askance by artists who are saying, how come there's no one at your museum who looks like me if you want to show my art? Um, and by a, a sort of larger trend, I think really very much uh, kickstarted once again by uh, larger protests like the Black Lives Matters protests that have emerged, uh, especially since Ferguson in 2014. So there's been a lot of pressure on museums and museums, interestingly enough, um, have showed themselves to be incredibly resilient when it comes to actually resisting, uh, you know, any major change to their institutions. And so while um, it, a follow-up report from the American Association of Museums found that staffing had changed, uh, uh, you know, that diversity among um, museum staff uh, since that first report uh, had increased, the increase was, you know, actually at a very small level. Um, and so I think that given so many museums have sort of for, for multiple reasons, including reasons of uh, marketability, uh, have foregrounded, um, more so foregrounded uh, the, the exhibition of Black art and artists over the past few years. I think the um, uh, 2020 uh, protests uh, really were a moment in which a lot of people were saying, okay, but what has that really meant? Um, what have all these noises that have been made towards uh, questions of social justice and, and racial equity within your institutions, what real tangible changes have resulted? And I think what a lot of people came out uh, feeling like uh, what that, that museums had 
done a lot in some aspects of their operations, but not nearly enough in others. Um, so that uh, museums had, for example, been much more likely to show Black artists over the last several years than they had been before, um, but they were, uh, but their staffing situation was not um, nearly where it should be. And so what was interesting uh, in the wake of June 2020 is that a lot of the critique of museums and their and their progress in relation to racial equity questions was actually uh, coming from within the institutions. And so you had a number of uh, museums, the Met Museum, the Guggenheim Museum, um, the New Museum in New York uh, alone, who staff actually mounted protests within the institutions uh, to force their institutions to uh, actually um, address problems not just of who was being hired, but how those people who were hired uh, were being treated once they were in the institutions. Uh, questions of, of, of salary, of institutional support, um, of, uh, you know, microaggressive behavior, of um, sometimes just straight up aggressive behavior, um, and, and all of those sorts of things. And so what you had, uh, interestingly enough, and that's what the, the slide on the right is, um, is referring to, uh, was a spate of what New York Times art critic Holly Cotter called, we must do better letters. Almost every museum put out a letter saying we have to do better. Uh, and, you know, of course, the question of, um, how one was going to do better and how that was measured, how those, how, how doing better, uh, what the metrics were going to be for that were uh, always vague and they were always, and they were coming from institutions that were um, uh, for their, in terms of their staff, believed to be um, incredibly hostile to actual making actual real changes. And I think uh, a lot of people credited those we have to do better letters with inspiring the um, internal sort of protests among staff at their museums because these museum staff saw their institutions kind of uh, putting out these statements of solidarity with Black Lives Matter protesters, saw them make great claims about how they were going to um, address racial equity issues uh, as if this was the first moment at which it became an urgency as opposed to now um, very many years into uh, a kind of struggle among blacks, black arts professionals, artists, curators, writers, all sorts of people to um, change the field. Uh, and so um, these and so these statements of solidarity uh, were interesting because they they um, provoked as much protest as they quelled. Uh, and, you know, I think that one of the things that many people in my circles were very worried about when we saw these statements is um, that museums would uh, take a diversity approach uh, to solving the problems that were uh, being revealed in the cultural landscape, uh, as opposed to an equity approach or a justice approach. In other words, that they would um, simply um, think about uh, uh, bringing more people to the table uh, without rebuilding the table, um, that they would think about making the table bigger as opposed to changing the entire shape of the table, um, let's say. And, uh, you know, for, for part, of the, part of that is the museum, museums tend to think that they can curate their way out of uh, you know, out of uh, problems of uh, racial exclusion. And part of that, and or to curate their way into political conversations that somehow if museums put on exhibitions that therefore they are somehow doing their 
duty towards making their institutions a more more equitable or more uh, genuinely and meaningfully inclusive. And so this was uh, became a real, um, I think the the anxiety that me and many of my colleagues had that museums were simply um, adopting quite facile approaches to the questions that were uh, being raised by, um, you know, as offshoots of the George Floyd protests was really um, uh, behind a, a very important uh, event that occurred, one that didn't get a huge amount of um, media play, but got enough. And that was the uh, chief curator of SF MoMA, who uh, was when asked by the community, by the arts community, by his own employees to, and by the sort of um, zeitgeist to uh, make his museum uh, more racially equitable, um, made a lot, put out a statement of solidarity. The museum put out a statement of solidarity with Black Lives Matter. They made a lot of noise about hiring practices and um, collecting the work of more artists of color uh, because museum uh, collections uh, tend to uh, severely underrepresent artists of color. So, you know, made gestures towards all those things. But um, in a number of meetings, both with the museum's board and with um, the, uh, his own, you know, sort of uh, museum-wide staff, uh, said that he was insisting on doing this without, he said, uh, slipping into reverse discrimination. Um, and he told his board of directors that, don't worry, we're still going to collect white artists. And I, I think that both of those statements um, very much triggered a, a, a harsh backlash among the staff and, and created a kind of PR disaster for the, for the museum because I think there is a, a way in which this is exactly what um, this, this indicated that museums were, you know, as certainly SF MoMA was and potentially other museums were missing the point. Uh, because, uh, you know, the point of, um, of, you know, of, of all these transformations should be the transformation of the institution uh, so as to undo uh, the mechanisms and processes that led to there being strongholds of whiteness and white culture in the first place, not just adding on as forms of window dressing, uh, black staff and uh, black ex exhibitions of black artists and, you know, um, additions to the permanent collection that were made by black and other POC artists. So his, um, his uh, comments and especially the comment about reverse discrimination, I think was uh, very triggering for people because of course reverse discrimination um, um, doesn't exist, uh, but it, um, it, it sounded, I think, to a lot of people as, uh, as an indication that, don't worry, whiteness will still be the center of our institution, but we have to do a little bit of catching up when it comes to people of color. Um, and this, so, so this was the context for another sort of very sort of interesting scandal, um, art world scandals. I mean, you know, we, you know, art world scandals are tempests, often tempests in teapots, but this one was uh, larger than normal. Um, and that was uh, at the end of uh, 2020, so around November, um, the four museums, um, four huge museums, uh, the National Gallery in Washington, the Metropolitan Museum in, or no, sorry, the Boston MFA, um, the Tate Museum and uh, the MFA Houston uh, announced that they were postponing a show by the artist Philip Gustin. Um, and this was a show uh, Gustin is a um, 
Gustin was, he passed away. Gustin was a white Jewish artist from New York who made um, uh, a lot of, uh, he, he made a lot of work uh, that had little directly to do with politics, but among his work is a series of paintings that um, use these, as you see in the photo accompanying this article, which is also an article from the New York Times, um, that use these cartoonish figures of Ku Klux Klansmen. Um, and these he really was doing in the 19, in the late 1960s, especially coinciding or in the aftermath of a lot of um, black civil rights um, activism in the US and, and real Black, so uh, the real impact of the Black civil rights movement in the U.S. And, uh, you know, Philip Gustin was a devoted leftist and his use of these figures was understood to be, he was, he was seen as, as a very, um, uh, you know, a great ally uh, uh, in various civil rights struggles because for him, the use of these figures were a way of understanding the complicity of white people in um, the um, in the kind of uh, in the, the 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 situation of racism in the U.S., and in fact, they were stand-ins for himself. So he was actually um, picturing himself as these sort of blithe, um, cartoonish, ridiculous uh, Ku Klux Klan's people who, you know, nevertheless had the um, intent and capacity to do great violence. And so here you see them uh, tootling along in their car, but accompanied by, in one case, a board with nails sticking out of it, um, meaning to do a terrific amount of damage. And so these were works that were, um, they mind humor, they, they, they were a form of self-portraiture, they were really a form of self-critique around uh, asking liberal art viewers to see themselves as complicit within these larger systems of oppression that uh, the, that many people in this country, um, Black people in this country, were fighting against. And so they, were, they are very complex works. They're, in my mind, they're terrific works. Um, so the museums decide to um, postpone this show. And the backlash to this postponement was immediate. Um, people started uh, uh, worrying that this era of political correctness was uh, dissuading museums from showing difficult art. Uh, people worried that, uh, people were outraged at the idea that museums were trying to avoid PR disasters because they were um, concerned about protest against the museum. And so, you know, for those people, it was like, you can't negotiate with terrorists. You can't not show art just because you think people will object um, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and you know, I, <laughs> who am always, uh, you know, I'm always a little, I'm always a little suspicious about being put in the position of feeling like I have to um, stand up to defend a white man, given the political context that we're in. I started thinking about this and realized that, in fact, this work that we were being told um, was extremely important to see precisely because it was asking white people to examine their own um, complicity in systems of racism and that at this moment in U.S. history, it was extremely important that we see works that deal with the really hard and nuanced and, and um, um, uncomfortable underbelly of um, our racist culture, that in fact this exhibition was being put on by four museums um, who have had a uh, until yesterday, almost no curators of color. Um, the Met Museum hired their first curator of color uh, in the first black 
curator in 30 years, um, uh, in 2019. Uh, the National Gallery hired their first Black curator yesterday. Uh, the Tate Museum has not had a, a, an upper level curator of color for a number of years as, uh, for ever as well. So these were all institutions the, and the, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts in addition, um, uh, no curators of color. So these are all institutions that whose curatorial staff is basically entirely white who are um, who are putting on a show uh, that has to do very much with the question of the Black Civil Rights Movement and the reaction to the Black Civil Rights Movement and has very much to do with whiteness. Um, and, you know, as many people have said, I think um, uh, Toni Morrison was one of the um, most eloquent people to say it. Um, when it comes to whiteness, the people who are the most expert on it are Black people because they have spent all of their lives trying to negotiate it. And so the idea then that um, this show was being put on uh, by, um, that this show was put together by uh, four white curators, that the catalog of the show included only one, uh, I'm sorry, two out of 17 Black writers, um, was, um, was being entirely overlooked in this conversation. And in fact, was the reason why these four museums realized that they had to postpone the show. So I think that what happened is that, or I know that what happened is that the museum directors realized that it was, that if this show was gonna be a PR disaster, it was going to be a PR disaster for the right reasons. In other words, the museums themselves had not done the work of transforming their institutions um, in a way that would prepare them or you know, give them the credibility to put on this particular show with its particular, you know, with, with the difficulties and the nuance of the work um, uh, at question. Um, and, so, uh, and so this was a really interesting moment for me because it really uh, coalesced, I think, something that I've been interested in for a long time, which is the question of how, um, the question of how uh, arguments over free speech um, tend to um, overshadow or subsume or in a sense cancel out uh, larger, more difficult questions of racial equity. And that was the centerpiece of a book that I wrote a few years ago called Whitewalling, Art, Race and Protest in Three Acts, which is a book really about the ways in which our cultural institutions are, uh, you know, often um, in an unexamined ways, uh, have been established to um, to house and to protect uh, white culture, um, and so that the inclusion of of the work of artists of color, the work of arts professionals of color, uh, is really understood as um, uh, as an incursion and uh, not uh, a kind of um, sense of native belonging. Uh, and so um, the book was prompted by another scandal. This was quite big one um, um, at the 2017 Whitney Museum Biennial, the Whitney Museum in New York City, uh, holds uh, every two years holds a major art exhibition that is supposed to give the sort of temperature of the US art world uh, by showing a broad cross section of the work of artists from around the country. And um, this particular biennial came after um, a, a particularly disastrous uh, Whitney Biennial, one that was um, actually overwhelmingly white um, in terms of the artists who were represented. Um, you know, one uh, artist group pointed out that, um, you know, it was made, the, the fact that there were only a handful of Black women artists shown at that previous biennial 
um, was made even worse by the fact that one of those black women artists was actually the fictional persona of a white male artist. Um, uh, Joe Scanlon, who uh, taught at Princeton at the time and lives and works in New York City. And so the, the 2017 biennial was meant to make up for um, the lack of diversity of the 2014 biennial. It was the first of the Whitney's biennials where both curators were um, people of color, non-Black in this case, non-Black people of color. And it was the most racially diverse biennial that the Whitney Museum had ever um, mounted. Unfortunately, that got kind of overshadowed by the fact that of the white artists included in the show, one of those, um, the artist Dana Schutz, a female painter who um, uh, lives in New York and is known for her sort of expressive and cartoonish sort of paintings of pop culture um, uh, and all, all, often very sort of dark and surrealistic um, cartoonish figures eating their own heads and things like that, um, had offered as one of the paintings in the show a image, and you see this depicted um, secondarily in this slide, uh, the, the image that you see hanging on the wall is a depiction of her painting uh, and her painting was called Open Casket and it was based on photographs of the 14 year old boy Emmett Till who was um, lynched um, in the south uh, for allegedly flirting with a white woman um, and uh, Emmett Till's mother uh, who they they lived in Chicago. He was down visiting relatives. When she came to claim the body, the the sheriff of the town said that he would only release the body if she would promise to have a closed casket funeral, because he didn't want um, the death of this child to to sort of inflame uh, the the town. He didn't want people to see. Um, and uh, Mamie Till Mobley, Emmett Till's mother, made the very courageous decision to um, uh, to um, have the casket be open. Um, and for journalists to photograph uh, Emmett Till in his casket. And those photographs, which were published both in uh, Black uh, magazines like Ebony and Jet, but also in Life magazines and, and predominantly white mainstream magazines are credited with, um, in a sense, uh, creating a great deal of white sympathy with the civil rights movement, which um, allowed for the um, passing of the Civil Rights Act. And so these are hugely important photographs, these photographs of Emmett Till in his casket. And um, when Dana Schutz, who had never addressed uh, Black issues before, issues of, of racism or racial injustice or anti-Blackness in her work before, decided to take on this painting in her sort of cartoonish style, a lot of people looked um, askance at this decision and protesters began um, uh, sort of uh, expressing their displeasure and uh, demanding that the museum remove the painting from the exhibition and that Dana Schutz, in order not to profit from an image of Black death, um, uh, suggests that she destroy the painting so that it would not enter the art market and become a, a sort of profit generating um, become a profit generating uh, object. And here what you're looking at is a, a image done by the um, young performance artist Parker Bright, who was one of the artists who actually uh, created a performance in the gallery itself. Uh, he would show up every day with this t-shirt with Black Death Spectacle on the back and put his living black body in between viewers and the painting and engage them in conversation about the appropriateness of showing this painting in the galleries. Um, but unsurprisingly, perhaps, uh, the conversation around 
the appropriateness around the question of curatorial responsibility, around the question of uh, the ethics of the institution for um, uh, putting images of Black death on display uh, as ways to sort of generate interest in their exhibition. All of these questions that protesters were raising were completely subsumed by um, uh, by a, a very vociferous counter protest, what I call a counter protest, by people who objected and said um, uh, that Dana Schutz's free speech rights were being uh, suppressed by protesters who thought that the painting, that the, dis the choice to display the painting was problematic. So no one was sort of questioning whether Dana Schutz had the right to create the painting, just whether the Whitney Museum, one of the most important American art museums, uh, you know, was obligated to show the painting, right? And so um, Pastiche Lumumba, another young, um, quite brilliant artist who works in the form of memes, uh, created um, some really terrific memes around this work, um, including this one. Um, the uh, artist Hannah Black, um, uh, sort of, you see an excerpt, I, I won't go through the whole thing on the left, but wrote a letter um, that ended up becoming a flashpoint in this protest because she uh, in it suggested that the painting be destroyed and not entered into any market or museum, which um, caused people to start comparing her to, um, you know, not Nazi book burners and, and other censors. Uh, and uh, on the right, uh, one of the, what do they call it? Um, galaxy brain memes that Pastiche Lumumba made um, uh, that sort of summarized, I, I think in, in a better way than I probably could in, in with more words, um, the kind of ways that um, this conversation went from artists can paint whatever they want Dana Schutz started an important conversation, so therefore she should get a pass. Only Nazis destroy art. What about Henry Taylor? Henry Taylor is a Black artist whose work in the show addressed police violence uh, against Black people. And then is Hannah Black even Black? Hannah Black uh, is of mixed race, and so um, uh, so someone as um, prominent as the author Zadie Smith actually sort of suggested in her response to uh, the debate that Hannah Black as a mixed race person wasn't, um, uh, was not sort of um, sufficiently Black to, to kind of enter into this conversation. And the, the, um, <clears throat> uh, the controversy became big enough that, you know, um, Whoopi Goldberg was talking about it on The View, which uh, for the art world, you know, for us art people is, um, you know, as big as it kind of gets. I think, you know, as much as uh, the culture industry is a huge part of the U.S. economy, um, we're not paid that much attention to. So the idea that this protest spilled out into popular culture as much as it did was a big deal. Um, sorry, I'm just going to um, fast forward. Um, and so one of the things that uh, really emerged from this is uh, what became clear over the course as this controversy played out and as many people, including Whoopi Goldberg, including Zadie Smith, including Coco Fusco, who's another very prominent Black a performance artist who uh, spoke out um, against the protesters and in favor of Dana Schutz uh, uh, being included in the show. Um, as this played out, where free speech was being pitted against uh, the kind of uh, critiques of the museum and its role in perpetuating a kind of fetishization of Black death. Um, another, you know, the, it became, it started to become clear that these free speech arguments were actually 
uh, being leveraged in very partial ways. So some people were being allowed the, you know, the protection of free speech and other people weren't. And so um, later that same summer, the Guggenheim Museum was putting on an exhibition of contemporary Chinese art. Um, it was filled with people whose names are very familiar outside of the US, um, uh, artists who are very well established within the Chinese contemporary art scene and pieces that have been displayed all over the world, including the US, but this was a major exhibition for the Guggenheim and it included a video by Sun Wan and Peng Yu called Dogs That Cannot Touch Each Other um, that was made in September 20, uh, 2003. And this video showed dogs on these treadmills um, attached to harnesses and the treadmills were going. And these dogs were trained fighting dogs. And these dogs were put on the treadmills and were, uh, as they had been trained to do, not by the artists, but by whoever trained them, um, they were trying to lunge at each other, but they weren't able to um, actually touch each other because of the way that the treadmills were set up and the fact that they were harnessed. So this was a this was a piece that was about barely restrained violence and it was uh, meant to comment on the kind of political precarity of the Chinese state at that moment, the historical moment. Um, and this piece along with another that included a thousand locusts uh, caught the eye of PETA, the animal rights group, and within days uh, generated a massive outcry where, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people uh, began signing petitions and writing to the museums to uh, cancel the show because of um, cruelty to animals. And uh, interestingly, the Guggenheim Museum, instead of, um, uh, instead of, as the Whitney Museum had, uh, invoking the artistic freedom or right to free speech of uh, the artists involved, immediately, um, immediately cancel, uh, remove those works from the show. And if fascinatingly enough, didn't even uh, inform the artists that the works were being immediately removed from the show. The artists themselves only found out when a New York Times reporter called them to get a comment from them. And that was the first that they heard that the museum was pulling the, the, the um, pieces from the show. So it didn't go unnoticed that there was a very different standard um, of, or a very different understanding of whose artistic freedom uh, or freedom of speech should be honored in this case than in another case. Um, and, uh, and it was um, especially galling for a number of uh, Black commentators, art world commentators, that, um, that it seemed like um, you know, a sort of um, deeply held belief was actually being uh, proven in real time that white people care more about animals than about black people. Um, and so um, that uh, became a sort of another uh, inflection point, I think, of the conversation around free speech and artistic freedom in relation to these conversations. Um, so, um, so I think that just I'm looking at the clock and I think that what I'll do is end there. Maybe we can um, have some questions or discussions. But, um, you know, my my sort of takeaway, I guess, for everyone is this uh, is this question, I think, that is facing uh, both uh, cultural institutions as well as people who are invested in changing cultural institutions, whether from inside or outside the in institution. Uh, first, about what the actual standards are uh, for transforming museums, whether museums can be genuinely transformed in order not to reproduce the kinds of 
exclusions, both in staffing, in permanent collection, in exhibitions, um, the kinds of exclusions and inequalities that have that that um, have been encoded in them from you know for for really um, decades and centuries, uh, and then the question of what responsibility uh, the platform you know these these uh, institutions have, not just as uh, collectors of and protectors of culture, but actually as platforms for um, work uh, and who they're going to, who they're going to make the effort, um, whose free speech they're going to make the effort to protect, um, whose work that th they're going to make the effort to um, platform. So with that, um, I think I'll maybe stop sharing my screen. And Haley will tell me what to do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Aruna. We really appreciate hearing from you and all of the knowledge that you have in this field. Mm. I honestly learned so much and it's only been 45 minutes. Um, I wanted to just remind all of our participants to please use the Q&A feature instead of the chat feature to answer questions. That way it's a little easier and we can mark them as answered as we get through the Q&A today. Um, Aruna, I wanted to ask actually, yeah. So you've talked a lot about cultural knowledge and, and sites of cultural production, but I was wondering how the exclusion that we see in these institutions also affects knowledge production, because that's something that I think about a lot, I guess, as an undergraduate student, um, the barriers to accessing that. Well, I mean, you know, there's, there's, it, you know, there's, there's different ways to think about it, obviously. So, so much of what it constitutes research in the cultural field um, happens through museums, happens through exhibition making and exhibition catalog making, the research that goes into that, um, the creation of archives, often creating exhibitions uh, with living artists uh, involves helping them create an archive of their own work. Um, and so, you know, these are all really important things. I think that, um, they, what has become clear as more and more uh, Black curators have entered the conversation, um, have become part of institutions at various levels, is that, um, that there is, there are questions of, of access to, art, to, to individual artists and archives, to access to aesthetic conversations that cannot, it cannot happen um, without uh, being um, part of the communities in which um, people, uh, in which these artists are operating. So literally like, you know, there are certain curators um, who are, um, who as part of their exhibition research, right? When they're black curators that I know, like Valerie Castles, Oliver, who um, is one of the great and really important curators uh, in the US right now, she talks about when she's trying to do an, an exhibition of an underknown uh, artist, uh, sh that she has gone to black churches in, uh, his original community to actually find the people who knew of him and his work in that community. And that that, that is a kind of um, a cultural competency, let's say, that uh, very few people outside of someone who's grown up in, in, those, in the context of attending Black churches and, you know, in the South specifically may not have. And I think that that there's a lot of cultural competency that is being lost when um, people, uh, when there is such an exclusionary kind of hiring practice. The other part of it, though, is that, you know, what I've seen in my life in the art world, so I, I entered grad school in New York in 1992, um, I graduated with my PhD in 99, and now it's already 2021. One of the things that has become clear is, you know, now when you talk to museum directors, like I'll, I'll, I talk about this stuff quite a lot, and I'll have these situations where random, a random museum director will walk up to me, I've never met them before, and say, 
we really don't have any black people on our staff and I know we have to change it. And I'll say, well, yes, you do have to change it. I'm not sure that what, like, you know, am I your confessor, your, your father confessor, but, you know, then they'll go on to say how hard it is to fill positions, right? Because there aren't people coming through the graduate student pipeline. And my response to that is always, um, you know, when I started grad school in the early 90s, most curators at the Museum of Modern Art, at the Whitney Museum, um, you know, at a lot of major museums didn't actually have PhDs. Um, they had master's degrees or they had MFA degrees, right? Uh, and um, as soon as MFA programs and master's programs in art history began graduating more and more students of color, especially Black students, suddenly museums were saying that, oh, well, to become a curator here, you have to have a PhD. So it's a, it was a matter, I mean, to me, it was very clear. And then as more and more uh, students went on, Black students went on to get PhDs in art history, um, suddenly in order to become a curator, you have to have a PhD in art history from a handful of Ivy League or other prominent schools, right? So to me, it seemed very much the case of um, uh, that, that there's always been this kind of shifting, um, in this case, credentialing, uh, shifting goalposts for entry into, um, into the field, which again, uh, uh, has huge implications for uh, knowledge production. Um, uh, and, you know, and, and that goes for academia as well. I think that, I think that, um, you know, there's, there's, uh, a great deal of, um, you know, when, when people talk to me about this, uh, these sorts of problems when it comes, to, you know, of, uh, being able to diversify staff, I, I sort of usually ask the question, um, can you tell me that every white male, white straight male that works at your institution, A, is the absolute top person in his field, or B, was perfectly trained and had nothing to learn by the time that they came into, um, into your institution, how many of those people were hired because you could see their potential uh, versus um, you know, it, it's, it's known that, that um, especially women of color, Black women in particular, are expected to have a, a kind of very extensive record of achievement as opposed to uh, being judged on their potential to achieve, right? So the, the, those are different standards as well. So, you know, so all of those things have, have a great deal of impact on who gets hired and then how knowledge is produced within the institution and within the larger, with our, within the larger field of art history. Um, uh, the, um, I think I saw earlier in the chat, someone had asked about uh, the fact that um, Sarah Lorson asked, um, do the Asian curators count uh, not count as curators of color um, because institute, some of the institutions have Asian curators. This is a really important question, I think, because um, it speaks to what I think is, is uh, an increasing, um, an increasingly important conversation that's happening among the, within the Asian community um, is that uh, while um, while there, uh, you know, of course, um, Asians are people of color, um, but the question of what that means in relation to, I think, addressing questions of anti-Blackness within the institution are two separate questions. So um, uh, it is very easy for me as a non-Black person of color to be um, uh, insensible uh, to um, anti-blackness within the institution because part of white culture's construction of me as a model minority is, uh, is the um, obviously false, but still uh, powerful discourse that there are 
minorities that are closer to whiteness. Some minorities are closer to whiteness than others. And so what you often, what, what we're really finding and the, the results of the most recent US election um, reinforced uh, the, the crowds that showed up for the um, pro-Trump um, protests slash riots last week uh, demonstrated is that there are plenty of Asians who uh, fully and enthusiastically partake in um, anti-black discourse in this country. And so I think that I, I, I think that it uh, becomes really important that we not pretend uh, that um, POC uh, is a, a sufficient, um, category of analysis when it comes to addressing anti-Blackness within U.S. cultural institutions. Um, and this was really underlined uh, really interestingly around the debates around the 2017 biennial, because, you know, there was a point at which um, there, there was a panel organized at the museum, and one of the curators stood up, and, or, when an artist stood up and said, look, in the 1990s, uh, the Whitney had on its staff Thelma Golden, who has now gone on, to, she's the director of the Studio Museum in New York. She is one of the most important curators in the country. She is uh, really one of the, um, you know, she is, she is a, a superstar, uh, really, in the cultural field. Um, but uh, this artist said, in the 1990s, you had Thelma Golden, um, and it feels like you never uh, sort of took to heart the lessons that Thelma Golden was trying to um, enact in her exhibitions and her in her work at the museum. And the Asian American curator who, one of the curators of the show said, well, I am a representative of how much uh, Thelma Golden changed the Whitney Museum. And that moment was really interesting because I think that from a multicultural perspective, 90s multiculturalism, that might have been true. But from uh, a 20 teens perspective, almost 2020 perspective, when we are much more attuned to the ways in which anti Blackness is. Uh, is a kind of specific and baked in form of racism in the way that, um, you know, the genocide of indigenous people is a, is a baked in form of, of, of um, racism within the US. I think it becomes harder to sort of say that by hiring Asian faculty, curators, whatever, that therefore you've solved the problem of anti-blackness within the institution. So um, I'm glad someone asked that question. Um, I see a question here about, from Chad, you raised the point about the degree to which white artists profit from depiction of black bodies. Is that a question that either has been investigated during using data or would it be interesting for the art community to do so? So um, th there, What's interesting, and then and then Chad has asked a follow up of, okay, and similarly, has there been database study of these credential gatekeeping issues you just mentioned? I think that the second question would be really interesting to study. I mean, I think that I think that you know my sense, if you look at say the curatorial department of the Museum of Modern Art in New York from the 90s, say 1993, when, you know, I worked there as like a graduate student researcher, I was, I was not a curator yet. Um, but if you look at that, it, it then compared to what it is now, I think you would find a huge um, difference in, um, in terms of the credentials of the people working there. I think that it would be a really important um, study to make, in fact, if anyone was interested, because I think that, you know, one of the things that museum, when I go around the country and I talk to museum directors and they come to me and they say, well, yes, we're, we're no better than the, you know, American Association of Museum pointed out, you know, our staff is like 85 to 90 percent white, but we just can't find the people to hire. Um, the, 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 the 
if you're looking, if you're only looking to hire people from elite institutions who have completed their PhDs, obviously you're already create, you know, limiting your pool in a way that you know a generation ago you weren't, right? Um, and so, um, uh, you know, to be able to come back and say, okay, look, uh, you're, you know just this number of years ago, museums weren't requiring PhDs. The, the art hasn't gotten more complicated. There's no reason that that this job should um, uh, re require it now when it didn't then. Um, and so if you change your expectations about who uh, is qualified, then you have a bigger pool to choose from. So I think that would be hugely useful. The question of the depiction of, of Black bodies and the, and the violence of Black bodies becomes interesting because, of course, um, there is, in that case, um, you know, it, it, there is always the, the problem of, um, you know, as, as that one meme referred to, when Henry Taylor at the same biennial um, depicted in a massive painting the murder of Philando Castile um, in his car, uh, people did not react to that, right? So, you know, this, this is where the question of the identity of the artist also comes into play, right? That there, there are, um, there is a kind of versions of in community speech and out of community speech um, that uh, have to be taken into account. So I think that there's, you know, I think that um, it, I think that it's it's something that whether it comes from a data science point of view or, or an art critical point of view of uh, highlighting, recognizing uh, the ubiquity of images of black death, right, in the museum um uh in uh the visual landscape i think that that um is something that i think needs to be done in a more uh in in a way um in a more sustained way whether it's a data science way or our critical way in the same way that in you know starting in the early 70s feminist art historians uh and art critics became much more vocal about actually naming um, uh, the, the um, naming the, the depiction of nude women that they saw so that the nude didn't become just a kind of prop within, uh, you know, paintings and sculptures, but actually we began to notice it. So um, Anyway, so I think that Haley is suggesting that we're sort of at the end of our time. Um, so thank you all.